Hello, everybody. I already start welcoming everybody while I still see that the numbers are going up. So uh, I keep talking for a while. Uh, it's just me. You will not miss uh, a lot just to keep you entertained uh, and to make sure that you are um, at the right event, because um, this is actually part of uh, the Deutsches Forum Sicherheitspolitik, so the annual flagship conference of the German Academy for Security Policy, BACS. Um, and this is the ECFR contribution to it. Um, we are organizing a discussion on European defense expectations and demands of non-EU partners. Um, so this is um, the place to be if you wanted to listen to ECFR and uh, non-EU partners' expectations on EU defense. Um, and we all hope that uh, even if you did not plan to come and just uh, by a, a accident bumped into the wrong uh, event that you uh, will stay with us and enjoy it a uh, big time. We are very sorry for the delay after three uh, years of pandemic and a lot of online um, events, we still uh, didn't get it right in, <laughs> in the very beginning. So, but now we are um, with you. And I um, take just a few moments to introduce my dear colleagues. Um, these are all, um, yeah, the best and the brightest um, we have at ECFR working on um, defense. I start um, in no particular order, but maybe I start with Camille Grand, who is our newbie, our new entry, and we are, we are very proud to have him with us. Um, Camille Grand is a distinguished fellow and works um, on security and defense and um, is also the way that kind of um, or, or, or that we decided to work with him is also due to the fact that ECFR uh, increasingly also wants to uh, enhance its capabilities and people working on security and defense. So Camille Grand um, has just joined us um, and has previously been working for NATO. Um, the others are the old guard of ECFR, old, uh, not uh, <laughs> meaning like really literally old, but um, if you have followed ECFR defense and security activities, um, you could not avoid them. Um, my colleague Gustav Gressel, who um, is a senior policy fellow with ECFR working particularly um, on um, everything militarily uh, east of Germany, so Russia, Ukraine, but also Georgia, Moldova, um, and is a military expert um, and a defense and security specialist. Uh, Ulrike Franke is my dear colleague who is now based in Paris and um, has previously been based in London. She works on drones, I think, with uh, the utmost passion, but also on European security, new technologies more broadly, um, everything uh, that is related to Macron and defense. Um, and <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm sure you know her um, because of her podcast, Sicherheitshalber. And last but not least, uh, Jeremy Shapiro is our mm. research director um, at ECFR, is an American um, uh, in residence in Berlin. Um, and yeah, Mm -hmm. has a particular focus on everything US related um, when it comes to security and defense. All of them have worked extensively on European security. Um, and we are going to um, start with Gustav, who will basically tell us, um, particularly looking at what the war has brought um, to the forefront, how much the Europeans are basically relying on others, on NATO, on the United States, on other actors, and how much uh, they are able uh, to bring to the table on their own. So how well uh, they are doing at the moment. So Gustav, over to you. And you Thanks have five to seven minutes. And if you go longer, uh, I'll mute you. Yeah, happy to, happy to cut me. Um, so I, I will talk a bit about a European dependency on the US for kind of large-scale continental maneuver warfare. I will not talk about crisis management, expeditionary warfare, um, going to Mali, going to Afghanistan, etc., because that's not not what the war now is about, or what what the defense talk is about now in Ukraine is about how we or how much we need the Americans to defend ourselves here in Europe. And, uh, well, the problem is where to start and where to end, because uh, this is kind of on all, on all ends we depend on the Americans, um, on quite embarrassing ends, to be honest. Um, and it starts with intelligence, uh, as you might have known. Uh, this, this war was quite accurately anticipated, both in intent as well as in scale, by uh, British and American intelligence agencies who 
first and foremost were able to uh, kind of break into Russian command and control systems uh, and and extract orders uh, of or certain units and plans uh, for the war. Actually, uh, they have known Russian war plans before the actual units that should execute this war plan have known their own orders, uh, which is which is a very good intelligence cycle. Um, the problem is, is Europeans are not even close to that. Um, so, uh, yeah, knowing that a war is around the corner is something that we depend on the Americans on. Uh, but then, of course, there are many other things of sort of day to day military and especially signal intelligence that make a huge uh, difference. Spotting troops, um, getting reports on positions, um, sort of uh, making after action assessment, how much damage did we do, uh, how effective was our strike, etc. All that is is done predominantly with the assistance of American intelligence assets, both spaceborne, airborne and and from ground and seaborne facilities. Uh, and it's essential. Um, it, it's not only uh, that Ukraine would probably have uh, done much worse in this war if there would be American intelligence. Um, Europeans would, would do even worse, probably, um, if, if it weren't. Uh, then let's go to the next complex, um, which now we also have a Ukraine component with the discussion of the fighter debate. How would Europe go into an air war against the Russian Air Force? We all have been mocking Russia for having a bad air force. Um, they seem to be unable to really uh, sort of gain air superiority in Ukraine. There were a lot of operative and tactical flaws in their planning, in the logistics, in the conduct of the air war over Ukraine. Uh, the problem is without the Americans, Europeans wouldn't be any better because uh, for conducting large scale uh, coordinated air operations, uh, especially offensive air operations to eliminate the other party's air force, we not only need American ammunition, uh, we also need uh, the uh, planning and coordination, intelligence, airspace surveillance assets that the US provide. Without them and without their command and control structure, we are um, we are not able to put up a uh, air operations that are much better than what the VKS does. Um, uh, and of course, on ammunition for air warfare, whether these are air-to-air -air missiles, whether these are air-to-ground missiles, uh, aircraft need to be armed sustained over time. And here we would also depend on the Americans. If you remember back in 2011 and our glorious expedition into Libya, that after four days needed to ask the Americans for uh, supply uh, standoff weapon systems, it wouldn't be any better against the Russians uh, because uh, the Eastern Front would be a much more target rich environment than Libya uh, at any case. Uh, then the cyber front. Um, um, so also a lot of people ask where has uh, the Russian cyber front has been? Why is Ukraine still standing? Why there's still a National Bank of Ukraine account you can donate money to? Uh, hasn't that all been hacked? Well, uh, this was prevented uh, and and dealt with with the assistance of Western cyber services, also particularly U.S. cyber services, but also. With the assistance of private enterprises who very much helped Ukraine uh, during especially the initial onslaught. Uh, I mean, the practical thing about uh, Russia cyber weapons were that they are very related to uh, cyber crime. Uh, so a lot of the civilian cybersecurity enterprises actually knew uh, the tools and instruments that were coming and were uh, correspondingly prepared to take them on. Uh, Europe does not have such a big and capable cyber industry. And though, although we are not, not talking about the government, it's still the US uh, that, that makes this difference. Um, least to say from Elon Musk and his um, Starlink uh, internet that at the very beginning when military command and control was pretty much down, uh, helped to be a capable substitute. It's getting tricky to operate it now as Russian electronic warfare adapts to it. Um, but uh, but especially at the initial phase of the war, this was a really, really important backup system that, that saved um, Ukraine from being cut off command and, uh, and communication. Well, other um, sort of talking of logistics, there are a lot of, well, actually Europe is doing better at producing 
dump artillery shells, uh, and that is important. Mass is important, artillery is important. So I, I don't want to belittle anybody for that. <clears throat> uh, but the problem is, for ex uh, for example, for surface-to-air missiles, for complex anti-tank guided missiles, for the quantities that would be necessary for such a war, uh, and the quantities that are necessary in the war in Ukraine, we also see that we are dependent on uh, US assistance because our own depots, our own supply chains are much too fragile, our production numbers are much too low to cope with such a high intensity scenario. Uh, so, so uh, even so face to air missiles, I mean, the Germans did a great effort on producing Iris T and Mars, but other countries with their so face to air missile system cannot keep up with the demand uh, that would uh, would be set up if they would deliver their, their missiles to Ukraine. Uh, and much of Ukrainian air defense basically now rests on American missiles. Um, the Patriot is the most famous one, but it's uh, the quantitatively the least important, quantitatively uh, NASA mass and the, the AIM-120, which now will become operational with F-16s in the air domain as well is the most important uh, ammunition to, to keep the bad guys off Ukrainian airspace. Um, and, and one important thing beyond two troop numbers, command and control. Um, so the problem with many European armies is they are bonsai armies. Uh, they are very small. Even the brigade is usually an administrative um, unit. You don't expect them to field entire cohesive brigades into combat. It, Czech army, Slovak army, they have some one plus br brigade, but they are by and large administrative armies. So ex except for the British, the French, the Germans, the Spaniards and the Italians and the Poles, of course, um, and the Scandinavians, uh, we have armies that are pretty much scattered. And if you want to unite them into cohesive formations, core armies, etc., to fight a large scale land war, you need to have a command and control structure, a logistical structure that provides that backbone for, for assembling all these little tiny armies together and, and form a cohesive structure. Uh, much of that uh, command and control equipment and capability within NATO is provided by the US. Um, so without them, we are pretty much screwed with, uh, on paper, a large number of soldiers, but unable to coordinate them and to feed them into battle in a coordinated and orderly manner. Um, yeah, so that was my seven minute take on our dependence on the Americans and uh, yeah. Do you think if I had asked you to tell us what the Europeans are capable of doing on their own, uh, you would have been able to fill seven minutes? Um, Just well, a quick follow up question for one minute. In, in terms in terms of a full scale war or, or in terms of military operations other than war because i think military operations other than war we are not too bad um i think we can but leave it if there. it comes to a kind of peer com competitor situation then then sort of the cracks start to appear okay uh, but i think this is uh, already gets us started so military operations other than war we are good at unfortunately um there is a war at our doorstep um, and I now turn to Jeremy, uh, who is um, maybe taking his um, European hat off or his honorary European hat off and his American uh, natural hat on and uh, kind of giving us the mirror image basically from the United States. So every everything seems to rely on you, intelligence, air defense, cyber, command and control. How do you think it, that feels from an American perspective? And what would be expectations towards the Europeans to make you and the US government feel better? Yes, as an American taxpayer, I found I, I, I um, felt tired just listening to uh, Gustav's list of things that they're dependent on, that Europeans are dependent on the United States for. I, I don't really think that the Washington view on what the Europeans should be able to provide is exactly a mystery. They have really, uh, U.S. governments have often and loudly demanded greater European contributions to common defense sectors. And frankly, most American policymakers, in my experience, know that they really need a strong European partner, uh, and they recognize that that partner would be more independent and that that independence would 
while not always welcome on specific issues, uh, to put it mildly, um, is still much less of a threat to a functional partnership than the type of increasingly and weak and irrelevant partner that Gustav was describing. Um, and frankly, I think we understand that ultimately American engagement in Europe is really only gonna persist if the US government and the US population can believe that it has something to gain from partners in, uh, in Europe. And, you know, I mean, Biden has just in the last year twice with with Macron stated that he sees the importance of a stronger and more comp, uh, and more capable European defense that contributes positively to uh, transatlantic and global security. Uh, so I don't think that's actually all that controversial in Washington. Um, it's true that US officials have at times um, had some unkind words to say about various European defense initiatives, but they haven't really done anything to stop them. And um, I think that they, uh, the problem broadly from a US perspective is not that they don't believe in the, in the wisdom of greater European contributions and even greater European independence. It's that they believe that it won't happen no matter what they do. I, I would say that there's, there's two central issues in this. The first is that, and I think Gustav kind of covered it uh, from the other side, is that Europeans have been losing power and military strength uh, relative to the United States and also relative to uh, Russia and China for quite some time. Um, so, I mean, I just picked, I just assembled some numbers for a recent paper. Um, since uh, since 2008, um, well, let's put it this way, between 2008 and 2021, US military expenditure increased from 656 billion to 801 billion. Uh, and in the same period, the military expenditure of the EU 27 and the UK combined rose only rose from 303 to 325 billion. So it was basically flat. Uh, US spends uh, on new defense, US spending on new defense technologies is seven times that of all EU member states combined. Um, and even, you know, military spending is obviously only a, an approximate measure of military strength, but Europe's divided approach to it, I think as Gustav was talking about all the dispersed armies, um, means that probably these figures actually overstate European military power and uh, because Europeans barely collaborate on their own, on their relatively small budget and it remains inefficient and they've fallen well short of the commitments that they made in 2017, the EU commitments to spend at least 35% of their procurement budgets on cooperation with one another. In fact, uh, the figure in 2021 was just 18%. So they weren't even, well, they were just over halfway there. I think that the second reason that Americans are very, very skeptical of, of a stronger European uh, in defense is that, uh, that Europeans are very divided on the issue themselves. Um, and uh, in fact, it seems from Washington generally that Europeans are more of an obstacle to a stronger European defense than Americans. Um, so countries like Poland and Sweden and the Baltic states, particularly when it comes to Russia, really deeply distrust a lot of the Western European states, particularly France and Germany. And it, they're very unlikely to base their uh, defense strategy on countries that they uh, so distrust. And I think that's why you see for example, uh, that a lot of the increased defense spending um, from, for example, Poland since the war began has been has been focused on U.S. weapons and South Korean weapons rather than on any kind of joint procurement program because they really want to make sure that in the first instance that they lock the U.S. in and the second instance that they don't get locked into uh, the French and the Germans. They want a U.S. presence in these Eastern countries, not an EU presence or a German presence or a um, or a um, French one. Um, I think that uh, the third thing that the U.S. really uh, that inhibits U.S. Uh, support for some of this stuff is is this question of arms sales, which I just hinted at in the, in the last point. Um, the U.S. does need uh, the, the sort of nature of U.S. defense spending in which uh, the unit cost is constantly going up as it move into high technology means that it's really very important 
to overall U.S. global strategy to be able to spread uh, arms sales beyond the United States in order to uh, in order to sort of well, yeah, recover the initial investment. Um, you can see this in projects like the F-35, which really is only uh, feasible even for even with that $801 billion in defense spending if it was spread over several countries. Europe is a key partner in that. Um, and so it is very difficult, I think, for U.S. defense firms and therefore the Pentagon to contemplate the kind of U.S. Def e European defense industrial base that so it would be necessary to create the political support for stronger EU defense markets. So in sum, what the US wants out of European defense is more spending and capabilities, but in ways that complements rather than supplants or, um, or duplicates the US presence. They want a non-competitive def defense industrial base that works through cooperative mechanisms like co-production, but also that has long-term dependence on US defense industrial supply chains. Um, and they want uh, Europeans to recognize the security implications of economic and, techn and techno technology relations with China and follow the US lead as a defend uh, the, the primary defender of Europe. I would say that within those three requirements, which are pretty, or desires, I should say, which are pretty broad, the US is very open to a lot of other things and frankly would accept a lot more then would accept losing on, on certain of those issues. Um, but they would have to believe that Europeans actually want it themselves and are actually going to push forward. And I think on a certain level, that's the biggest obstacle. Thank you, Jeremy. I think um, we will go into questions here later with the audience. Um, I have um, some. And this is also a hint for the audience. So if you want to ask questions, put them in the Q&A or F&A, as we say in German um, section. So that we'll come to that later. But maybe just one, one thing, Jeremy, you said that the American administrations have never actively done anything to stop the Europeans. And um, I'm old enough to remember phone calls by the Trump administration in Europe when we discussed the uh, European Defense Fund and PESCO and third party participation. And I think there was actually active meddling and active encouraging some kind of more friendly European uh, governments to, to block this. Um, so isn't there also kind of a counterproductive, um, yeah, relationship there... between the, the coming from the United States, not really encouraging the Europeans to do more? Do you want me to take that now? Yeah. Yeah, maybe um, just if you have just a short sure. comment, and then yeah, I think I think that there has been at times, and not just in the Trump administration, but um, that's a particularly stark example at times that what in which the U.S. has said, well, gee, maybe this isn't a good idea, and times in which they've encouraged countries like uh, countries in the East to um, you know mention that in European councils. Um, so I, I take your point on that. What I meant is they've never done anything sort of active to really get in the way. If, if the Europeans were capable of making these decisions, the Americans would accept them. Uh, they're not actually going to do anything uh, tangible to get in the way. But yeah, there, there have been diplomatic efforts at times uh, on specific issues that run afoul of the three requirements that I just talked about. There are already uh, related questions. Good that we come to the discussion later, but there are already related questions in the chat. Um, maybe you can familiarize yourself with them uh, while I give the floor to Camille and we come back to the questions. They come back to precisely the topic we are uh, talking about now, uh, cooperation between the Europeans and the United States. But Camille, give us a kind of, um, yeah, give us the view from, from NATO um, and yeah, how are these Europeans doing kind of, not the European pillar of NATO, but the other Europeans. <laughs> well, <laughs> They're outside um, NATO existence. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, I'll, I'll very much follow up on some of the points that Jeremy made, but uh, I think it's interesting to indeed uh, look at how NATO perceives that, which is, of course, a bit of a of a strange thing because NATO is, um, you know, two-thirds of the memberships are EU member states, um, uh, even though only about 25 to 30 percent of the defense spending are, are made known by the EU member states in the same uh, organization. So um, it, there is there is a uh, there is a, a question there. But I'll try to um, uh, sketch this out by uh, looking at 
you know the, the sort of where we were and where we are heading in in a way uh, to to try to to see if we, if, the, if we can move this forward. First of all, I, I, uh, to to take it where Jeremy left it, there are obviously in the NATO environment some ambivalent uh, uh, um, relationship to the EU effort. Um, uh, there is a uh, competition cooperation paradigm that, that has been there for many, many years. Uh, and and uh, half of the effort has been to explain that all of this is perfectly compatible. And the other half has been to, to, to try to explain that it was a major problem for the organization and that uh, no such thing as, as an EU defense uh, uh, independent effort would be uh, acceptable uh, for, for, for NATO. Um, the, the reality is that things, uh, the both organizations have come much closer than they, they were um, over time. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we have uh, had three NATO EU joint declaration. Uh, so th those look like pretty boring pieces of paper listing lo long lists of, of, of uh, 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 to do list of things on which uh, both organizations should work together. The reality is that uh, this has changed the atmospherics um, in a way. Uh, both organizations know each other better, uh, work more closely together. Uh, this is very constrained, and I'll come back to that by a number of allies, but there is a, a sort of political message that we need to work more closely together. And that is the whole intent of those declarations signed, the late, latest one by uh, President von der Leyen, President Charles Michel, and the NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. Interestingly, those are signed by the leaders of the organizations, not per se by both organizations, which is a way to avoid what um, uh, uh, at, uh, the, the notion that uh, uh, we need to uh, perfectly understand what is acceptable for the Cypriots or the Turks uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the closeness of the relationship. So, but having said this, I think we, the, the, so the, the relationship has evolved from rather um, hostile to, to a form of, uh, uh, a bit ignoring each other, uh, uh, you know, so sort of making good statements, but not working very seriously together, partially because of these constraints of uh, uh, to share um, classified information, to do things together, and, and so on. Partially also because both organizations, although they are located in the same town, uh, Brussels, uh, uh, are not very familiar with each other. And it's all the more true when you go into the NATO deep state or the EU deep state, uh, which are, have grown as, as separate organizations with a with a different uh, membership and a different uh, uh, um, uh, um, strategic culture, if I may put it this way. Within NATO, of course, we have multiple stakeholders. We have the um, uh, uh, 21, 20, now 22, soon 23 EU member states who are, um, you would expect to be the strongest proponent of the EU in the NATO environment, which are not, in fact, many of them uh, are um, uh, not that clear about defending the EU within NATO, partially because sometimes the um, instruction chains in the capitals are different from, uh, so they, they, they don't, it's, it's a bit like if the left hand was not trying, talking to the right hand. Um, uh, part of it, because the, one of the lessons as uh, Gustav and, and uh, uh, Jeremy alluded to uh, uh, the lesson drawn from the current uh, crisis in Ukraine is we are in fact very dependent on the US, therefore NATO is the, the only game in town and let's not uh, mess things up. Um, so EU allies, what we call EU allies, so EU member states that are also NATO allies, are in fact a bit divided on the importance of the relationship and how much they want to invest in, in promoting the EU within NATO and therefore making the case for a more solid relationship. Non-EU allies are, are uh, you know, so the, those um, uh, seven countries that are not EU member states as we speak, um, they, they are not a, a cohesive group. Uh, so you have the US, a sort of standalone case uh, that uh, uh, Jeremy just described pretty well, very focused on burden sharing, uh, and sometimes saying, sending, and that would be my, my uh, two cent uh, addition, a bit of an ambiguous message of saying, okay, this is good and fine, but don't do this, don't do that, um, uh, 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 behind the lines. And I, I'm not sure there is a, a lot of clarity. I'll come back to this on the US side on this. There are those who are very close to the EU, either because they are applying for membership, many in the Western Balkans, or because they are associated to most of EU um, uh, uh, initiatives, uh, Norway typically, which is as a sort of a, uh, um, uh, seat on most of the EU initiatives and is associated to all of the EU defense uh, initiatives. 
And then you have the, uh, again, uh, cases slightly different, UK, Canada, Turkey, uh, which uh, promoted a specific agenda. In the case of Canada, it's mostly about avoiding uh, the EU-US relationship becoming the transatlantic relationship. So they, have a, they are very wedded to the NATO framework. Um, UK, uh, the sort of post-Brexit environment that I'm sure uh, uh, Ulrike would come, come back to, uh, which, is, which has created a, a big focus on NATO versus the EU in the, the British case, and Turkey, which often blocks things uh, a bit as a, uh, a to, to uh, take a, a bit of a revenge for being uh, blocked out of some of the EU initiatives. So that there, there is a, a, a tricky issue of uh, how is Turkey treated by the EU triggers how is NATO ready to treat the EU? Um, uh, because of course, every decision at NATO is taken by consensus. So, so there, the, the, but the, the common point for all of them is this notion of inclusiveness. How can, are they associated with the new initiatives? Can we? Can they have access to EU uh, funding? Can they have? Uh, can they be part? Uh, can their industry benefit from EU uh, initiatives and and uh, uh, and so on? So that's the very big. Key for for many of them, and and uh, the sort of notion of the whole thing being open. Then there is a last actor. Uh, you would say, who are these, which are neither uh, EU nor non-EU, which is the bureaucracy, <laughs> which is a standalone actor, uh, um, which honestly tends to be a bit focused on competition. There is a, a bit of a fear uh, that uh, uh, if the EU expands its role. It's going to be at the expense of NATO, so therefore NATO needs an innovation initiative after the establishment of the uh, uh, European Defence Fund, needs uh, 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 to uh, spend on, on, uh, on a number of issues uh, in order to sort of match the, the EU initiatives and, and remain relevant, which is the sort of natural inclination of the NATO bureaucracy uh, there. So this environment is, in my view, changing quite rapidly in light of the war in Ukraine. And, and I don't need to expand too much on that because Gustav covered a lot of that. But in a way, um, NATO's role in Ukraine has been both essential and constrained. Essential because it's sort of NATO back to core business, uh, um, deterrence and defense function, collective defense, territory of defense, uh, which then allows uh, sort of uh, uh, is a much clearer definition of what NATO does. So, so the sort of debates that we could have a few years ago of who's going to do the um, uh, training mission in Iraq or in uh, Libya or wherever uh, is no longer relevant in, in many ways uh, because the focus is very much on the defense of Europe. Uh, so that, that helps clarify a few things. But it's also a role that is constrained because allies and uh, have decided that NATO should not be at the forefront of delivering arms should not be at the forefront of training Ukrainians. And NATO as an organization has its hands a bit tied by the allies themselves, including the US and non, other non-EU allies by saying, whoa, 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 we don't want this to turn into a NATO-Russia confrontation. So we try to not put too much of a NATO flag on what we do for Ukraine. On the other hand, the EU has grown and is growing and sort of learning in, by doing, in doing things that it didn't do um, uh, a year ago. Um, uh, training uh, on a large scale the armed forces of a country at war with Russia. You know, who would have said that? Um, uh, buying weapons out of uh, uh, and, and uh, for, for a country at war with Russia. Uh, investing in defense industry to enable them to, um, to or industries to do that. So, so this is a, uh, there is a bit of a massive change there, which in my view creates opportunities because we have more clarity on who does what and who's good at what uh, in this environment. So that lends, leads me to, to close on a, on a plea, which is a, a bit the, the, the argument of a, of a time for a new uh, quid pro quo on, on all of this. I think we've been using a, a lot of um, either um, um, phrases that don't mean much because they are, they are they, they're definition, they are poorly defined. Strategic autonomy is one of them. Uh, uh, um, or very old uh, uh, stories which go back to the 1990s and Mellon Albright and the 3Ds, so don't duplicate, don't decouple and all of that. When now we all see that in a number of domains, you, there is useful duplication, there is necessary duplication. It makes sense to, to, uh, to have this in the burden sharing debate with the US it, uh, and both organizations can be more mutually supportive than having to sort of try to define which does what and, and, and so on and so forth. 
So, so the whole, my, my plea from this is that I think there is a need for both a conversation amongst Europeans on what is it, uh, how are we gonna play on these both, both uh, organizations? And second, a transatlantic conversation on saying the sort of who does what. And, I, and there I'll, I'll end up on Senator Warner's uh, uh, comment in the early 2000s, which is we do the cooking and you do the dishes, a division of labor, which I'm not sure is, is uh, relevant today. But uh, he, he, uh, and in, in fact, it's a plea for the Europeans to do more, but also uh, uh, for the Americans to have a sort of much more honest conversation on, on this with Europeans to uh, clarify their, their level of expectation, which should not only about spending more, but OK, what does that mean in, in terms of uh, allowing the Europeans or allowing, encouraging the Europeans uh, to invest in some critical capabilities that only the Americans provide so far? I mean, I'm talking about strategic enablers uh, or uh, uh, relying more on European capabilities to do certain things. And I suspect that the post war situation, in, uh, in uh, uh, even assuming a, a, a happy outcome of, of this uh, of this dreadful conflict, uh, uh, all of these questions would be po posed in a very acute fashion, whomever is in the White House, uh, if I may um, add to this, uh, but and also- I think we whomever, need to leave it uh, here for a moment, Camille. And I'm done. That was my last <laughs> sentence. I'm good. Okay. Um, so Rike, I, I turn to you as uh, kind of for the um, kind of final round of introductory remarks. I've recently been to London and I came back encouraged because I thought, well, the UK, there is a new openness to work with the European Union and uh, less bitterness in the air. Am I right? Is, and what would it take for the UK to open up more to the EU? I mean, and we can then later check whether that makes sense from a European perspective, but what is the mood in the UK? Uh, thanks, Jana. And yeah, I actually think you are right. Um, so I stand in the way of, of the discussion, so I'll, I'll keep this short, but I, I, I thought I'll share kind of three observations or insights on the way that, yeah, the UK, EU, defense and security cooperation discussion is, is currently going. And then I'll, I'll make a final point, maybe on a few other um, kind of non-EU countries and how they are looking at the EU's uh, efforts. But um, the first observation is very much what you what you just said, Jana, and that is that after after a time of real kind of stalemate and stagnation, I think serious discussions between the EU and the UK on defense are beginning and are um, taking place. So we really, you know, ever since Brexit happened, there really was this kind of standstill on security and defense simply because in the withdrawal agreement, they just skipped security and defense. They couldn't really get a, um, get a sense of what they wanted to do. Um, it was too difficult. The whole Brexit was a mess anyway. And so this was just kind of, you know, it fell over the edge and, and there we were. So for quite a long time, there wasn't really um, any movement. This has changed now and it has changed for three reasons, really. Um, the first reason is that, well, time has passed and we are slowly getting over Brexit. Um, and one very important step really was the, the winter framework um, that we recently had between London and Brussels or Northern Ireland, so not specifically on security and defense, but it just showed that the EU and, and uh, the UK can kind of come together and solve problems. And this has kind of created a, a better mood as, as, as Jana was, was saying um, in London and also in Brussels. The second reason why things are getting better, of course, is uh, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And as, as you know, absolutely terrible that this is, but um, for example, the uh, Russian invasion has led to the UK to rethink or rather refresh their integrated review. So the, the UK uh, published an integrated review, a kind of national security strategy, if you like, in 2021. Um, and it had, as we put it at the time, and EU-sized hole in it, meaning that I think on, I actually wrote this down, on 114 pages, there were two mentions of the EU and really, you know, EU-shaped hole. It really felt as if the EU wasn't, didn't exist in security and defense. It was very, very odd. And Brussels also very much read it this way. Um, and then, you know, the war happened and all of this, and now the UK has published a refresh of the integrated review, just, just uh, two years uh, later, and that looks better. I mean, there is more and more of a willingness to engage with the EU. There is an acknowledgement that the EU is an actor on security and defense, and, and yeah, and then, then things are, are happening. Um, 
And then uh, finally, um, also another reason why things are moving, and this is something that Camille already said, so just very briefly, there is a kind of EU NATO rapprochement, um, or at least a discussion happening, right? Um, Sweden and Finland joining, I mean, Finland joining, Sweden hopefully joining the EU means that even more EU member states are NATO members. Um, there is a general increase in, in work on this in, in the light of the war, as, as can be also mentioned, more discussion on the kind of European pillar in NATO rather than European economy, if you want to use that term. So, so this, this all kind of is, is helping this. So what is, is happening? So there are now, as I hear, regular though informal uh, coordination and, and uh, discussion meetings. Um, you see, you know, for example, just recently the UK Armed Force Minister, Armed Forces Minister was were attended the, the EU Human Security and Defense Forum. The United Kingdom has now joined a PESCO project. Um, so PESCO, the kind of EU's uh, way of cooperating on um, military projects, if you like, there's there's one, the military mobility project that the United Kingdom has now joined. And this really is seen as, as quite a big step because even when the UK was still in the EU, they weren't too 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 much a fan of, of any of these projects. So now it it has it has joined. Uh, so yeah, I think things are moving forward. That's you know the kind of first insight. The second insight, however, is that well, the kind of main issue still remains, and this has funnily, in a way, more to do with with process than content, if you like. I mean, there is an agreement that it makes sense for the EU and UK to work together on 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 security and defense. They are on the same continent, or at least you know in the same region. Um, it, geographically you know they, they they should be going together but when it comes to how the the method the process um there are very different ideas because the uk basically wants to do kind of a top flexible uh cooperation with the eu and that's not how the eu works the eu is an institution the eu wants institutionalized um uh ways of of cooperating and and this is this is quite tricky because there's really a kind of difference in uh, in approach, and, and neither side really wants to budge on that. In brackets, I think the UK would have to budge on that because I don't think the EU will, but but there we are. Um, which also means that the UK is now very much looking into kind of bilateral cooperation. There's, oh, you know, over just the last few years, if you check the news, there was um, many bilateral cooperations being started between between the UK and individual EU states. Um, where that's gonna gonna lead uh, is is a question in and of itself, but yeah. And then there's also the question still within the kind of forum or methods or approach uh, bracket or basket of the E3, right? The E3 is this kind of format where the big European countries, France, Germany, and the UK come together and, and decide on things. And the UK really likes this format um, because it gives it a kind of outsized importance, if you like, because then you know it's one out of three. Um, rather than one junior partner to the EU, but this is exactly the reason why why many Europeans um, and the EU don't don't like this format. So I don't think that this is going to you know have the the biggest future uh, future there. But yeah, so this problem remains. Third observation: a change in government in the UK could really change things, um, and. So right now it's very funny being in London because everyone kind of operates on the on the assumption that yeah we'll have a, a Labour government uh, at, at the next round of elections we'll see I've never been good at predicting UK elections so I won't I won't this time but right now I think Labour is pulling uh, is uh, uh, is seventeen percent ahead ahead of the Conservatives so they might win the next uh, election and that would be a good that would be good news from a from a EU UK cooperation. Uh, viewpoint, and not just on security and defense, but but in general, but also on security and defense, because labor wants more more uh, cooperation. Uh, is, is very is very clear about this. So the shadow foreign secretary David Lamy, David Lamy, has been uh, particularly outspoken uh, on this. He said, "I believe there is much more that we can do with Europe um, in partnerships. Uh, sorry, on defense in partnerships with the." Uh, EU and bilaterally, he even spoke about an EU-UK security pact and wanted, and this is important, remember point two, he wanted or he wants regular EU-UK summits and structured dialogue, so maybe also some movement on 
on the format issue that I, I mentioned. So yes, things are moving in the right direction. If we get a new government, it's probably going to be even easier for the EU, but, but we'll see, very difficult to predict. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, we're basically talking about these kind of approach issues even more than, than about the, the content, but I'm happy to discuss this. And just one final sentence on um, kind of other, other third parties, because I think this is really important, because just you know over the last one or two years, I've gotten, and I'm not the only one, I've gotten so many requests from kind of non-EU members, sorry, non-EU states that are basically asking, you know, what's the EU doing? Do we need to be involved? Should we be involved? Can we be involved? Because there really is a realization that the EU is moving forward on security and defense. And not everyone necessarily likes it, but it's clearly happening. And money, real money is being spent. And that's the moment where other states kind of start to listen and think, huh, do we need to be involved here? And so you have states like, you know, Switzerland, so European states, not in the EU, but also Canada, you know, other kind of Western states, not in the EU, not in Europe, that are really looking into this and are trying to find out whether they can be involved in, in PESCO and European Defense Fund and, and all of these um, efforts. Right now, the answer is yes, you can be involved, but also because of Brexit, the EU has made, has made it very clear that being inside is better than being outside. So right now, to put it in one sentence, I would say that being involved doesn't get you quite quite a lot and you end up you know paying but not necessarily getting that much out of it so it's not ideal yet in terms of third party uh, integration or cooperation in that regard um so definitely something for the eu to to work on and for us to um to keep an eye on and i'll end here because i know that already there are already loads of questions so. yeah and um I mean, I'm happy that you ended on a positive note saying, yes, the EU is getting more and more attractive and more and more uh, non-EU partners want to work with us. But I'm wondering whether that is so true. And we have a question from Mohamed Aloui. Um, and he asks, what are the current initiatives and plans within the EU to strengthen its defense capabilities and enhance its role as a security actor? Um, so. Um, maybe you can just, um, oh, whoever volunteers, or maybe I start with Gustav, who, um, who gave the introduction. So looking at um, what the EU is currently doing and the demands, is the EU really moving forward? Is the EU up to the task? Are there promising initiatives? Um, what about the um the the, the 500 billion a uh, million um not billion unfortunately <laughs> that the commission has put to the table so give is there something that gives you hope Gustav shall I start with you yeah <clears throat> I mean first I would distinguish the role with increasing defense capabilities and becoming a security actor uh, because these are entirely two different pairs of shoes that should not be mixed up uh, the EU does a lot, and I think the EU will have a major role to play in strengthening European defense capabilities. It will not become an independent defense actor. Um, so on ammunition production, we see now basically the first time that the EU puts money on the table by itself. The 500 millions that were put on the table for common defense procurement are not enthusiastically used, first of all, because the 500 million in itself is still a considerable small amount. The second thing is the problem is now all nation states within EU do kind of emergency uh, procurement on the fly. Like, oh, holy dot, dot, dot. We have a shortest off and then comes the big list. And where's how's the quickest way to buy that? Uh, we don't yet have really proper coordinated procurement. Um, I think it will start over time. The Scandinavians probably lead the way on this with trying to join uh, their merger, their air forces. Um, and there are some big, big ticket procurement decisions that will then have to be made on trainers, on uh, ground based raiders, uh, uh, signaling equipment, etc. That will will see sort of we'll see how how that then in practice. Uh, it will go down, but uh, that will be the plan. I mean, the sort of the biggest role for the EU to play is to kind of erode the monopoly of national champions within the EU, because as much as 
there's debate about how big of a threat the uh, American defense industry is to Europe, and if Europe uh, defense market kind of would it be all would wouldn't it, we all be forced to buy Americans? The problem is the biggest threat to the common European defense markets are the Europeans themselves, uh, national champions for ridiculous niche projects. Um, and and basically, European weapons have become too expensive for this kind of nonsense by now. Uh, and here, the Commission is trying to better very hard um, to, to have an inroad. Uh, the war provides a context to do that. Uh, we'll see how far they will come. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I think I'll stop it with that. So I turn to, to Jeremy for giving the American perspective on both um, a common EU defense market and basically yeah, the EU ambitions more broadly. But Gustav, just staying with you for a second, because there was one question, um, a, a specific question, because you mentioned command and control um, as um, an area where we rely on the United States. And um, one of our listeners brought up the a uh, plan of a uh, EU M uh, PCC uh, whenever it is going to yeah uh, see the uh, light of the day um, and, and and but um, so would that change or can the new EU M PCC change our dependence? Who's that? You need to unmute yourself. So, okay, still me. Uh, no, uh, I, I mean the, the the military planning and um, what is it? Planning and coordination cell uh, is quite dependent on NATO assets and personnel. Basically, people sort of changing one hat for the other for lunch break, um, and it's made for out of for for kind of planning out of area operations. But even the EU mission in a EU force in Bosnia is basically dependent on NATO for planning and execution. So it is kind of, I, I, I honestly, I mean, yes, for some kind of military advice, it's nice to have this kind of stuff, but this is the kind of unnecessary du duplications, I think, for, for a lot of the European defense stuff that really is, uh, is graining a lot of attraction by all these guys who study the boxes of administrative affairs within Europe but have will have zero impact on um uh, on operations abroad uh, the other thing what i should mention with sort of command and control well there are two things um independent european command and control within the eu i think that like the mpcc that's much of a kind of uh, why and the second thing is do more within NATO uh, uh, that is European uh, to have, because NATO has already an existing command structure for air, land and naval operations that is functioning, that is operational, that has all the technical assets, most of them being American. Uh, if you would slowly replace them by European assets, I think the Americans would be pretty happy because they don't have to fund this stuff. Uh, and the second thing is uh, we, would, uh, we would sort of have a, a greater... I know this loaded term autonomy is loaded, but we will have a kind of greater responsibility for, for security within our own perimeter. Uh, and that would make us probably psychologically rest a bit um, a bit more secure. But that is European sort of European share within NATO, not sort of trying to recreate NATO in the EU, which so would only no be fan... necessary if Turkey goes completely mad. Um, <laughs> this is a different affair than we will. Uh... But so you're no fan of a real European headquarters. I mean, not an embryotic, embryonic uh, version of it. Uh... I'm I'm not a fan about bureaucratic structures um, and and the belief that bureaucratic structures will lead to policy. They don't. Okay. Political decisions lead to policy, uh, and they will find the bureaucratic structures that they'll need to implement it. Okay. Uh, I, 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 I don't think that sort of creating bureaucratic boxes for the sake of creating bureaucratic boxes um, creates anything. The problem with Europeans not being a unified actor lies within the capitals and their inability to come up with a unified vision, what they actually want to achieve. As long as you don't know what you want to achieve, you will never find the right bureaucratic box to do the thing you don't want to do. Yeah, I think so far that has been the fate of the EU MPCC as well, but that's my personal opinion. Jeremy, um, over to you. So the American view on a uh, common European defense market, and then there is there are some others that are directed really 
particularly to you, but it's it's very much on the um, American view of a stronger European defense industrial base. Um, yeah. And yes. one specific question, would the US agree to co-produce uh, in Europe and yeah, to co-production of EU weapons and ammunitions? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I, the US would definitely agree to co-production. Of course, they've already, they're already doing a fair amount of co-production. The F-35, which I talked about, there's a final assembly plant in Italy, which is assembling all of the F-35s that have been bought by Italy and Netherlands and uh, and the F thirty five and of course the British had a big role in the production of that airplane um, and there's many other transatlantic defense cooperation projects. I mean they are all essentially um, led by the Americans and maybe maybe more importantly what they are based on sort of U.S. designs and U.S. technology that means that you become part of the U.S defense industrial supply chain and you are subject to the you know to US policy in terms of re-export and even the use of some of this equipment so it is it is to participate in that co-production very much sort of locks you into for better or for worse I think mostly for better to be fair uh that system and uh they could do a lot more they could be uh more evenly distributed uh and these are political bargains which I think are quite possible, um, and uh, which I think uh, there's quite a lot uh, that could be done on that. Um, in terms, but I do think that the point that a lot of people, a couple of the questioners, were really getting at, which is this idea that the that the defense industrial base, the defense arms market, is one of the central reasons that the U.S. is uncomfortable with uh, some uh, some of the European autonomy initiatives. I think is really quite right. Uh, I, I don't think that the, you know, it's true that they express dissatisfaction or worry about other elements, including command structures and everything, but actually all of that is really quite finessable. The, 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 the rubber really hits the road on uh, defense industrial issues. Um, and that's, of course, when, when you were citing an issue that the Trump administration was angry at, the, uh, that it was a defense industrial issue. And, and this is, as I said, because the European market and export markets in general are really important. I believe that with, with effective co-production, they could reduce that. Um, but I think that a lot of the US defense companies and the and a lot of the um uh a lot of the in the Pentagon is very, very suspicious of that. And I think it's really important to understand just how central this is to US global strategy, because the the issue that Gustav was talking about with smaller European countries being unable to produce the high-tech weapons, th that's even becoming an issue for the United States. And it needs to be able to distribute these defense sales amongst, amongst its allies. And Europe is not, actually, it's not, the, it's not the most important market for that. Probably the Gulf is, but Europe is quite important and it's becoming more so. Um, the, in terms of the other questions, I guess the um, there was one question on the... Um, on whether there is a broad-based domestic constituency across the EU for a more integrated European defense policy which from, from Brian, Brian Burton, who I think actually also wrote a very good article in just in the War on the Rocks last week on um, co-production. So you should, I would, in, I would uh, tell people to look at that, advise people to look at that. Um, but in any case, I think the, the, the sort of hint of his question is right. There is there, there really isn't a broad-based constituency for this. It's more than just, to be fair, it's more than just an elite-driven initiative from Brussels. It's also an elite-driven initiative from, from Paris. Um, and, and there's a few other centers of this, but I think by and large, uh, most of the EU countries don't want, don't really want this, uh, particularly the smaller ones, particularly the Eastern ones. Uh, it's important to say that during the Trump administration, when he was saying things like uh, that, you know, maybe maybe the U.S. would leave NATO, that uh, it, there was a lot uh, there was a lot more support in a lot more countries. But at the moment, with the Biden administration, um, they have the they have the American administration of their dreams, I think, and they are not. And by and large, most countries and certainly the public is not interested in this. Um, but of course, if you ask them given that they just had this experience and given that the last three American presidents have said they were gonna to shift to Asia and given that Trump 
not only was the last president, but could conceivably be the next one, uh, they are worried. Uh, and country, people in countries like Germany and the Netherlands and Denmark are actually quite worried about this, and so are at least looking for hedges, but it isn't their preferred policy. And there was one very interesting question uh, in the chat on the German Zeitenwende. Um, oh, sure. And uh, I yeah, think, I can... yeah. So it tells you a lot also about kind of um, German thinking on it. So how much pressure was there from the US? Uh, how much pressure was there on Olaf Scholz to change his mind, to change the direction of German policy on Russia, on energy? Or was that all our doing? No. <laughs> um, well, it's clear that Zeitenwende is a German idea because no American has any idea what the word means. Um, but uh, it, it is also clear that uh, although the specifics of it were certainly determined by the German government, that there was quite a lot of pressure in this regard. And in fact, um, Schultz was in Washington on the 8th of February of 2022. Uh, and visited Biden in the White House. And it was, it's, it, in retrospect, we know that at that meeting, you know, Biden said, well, the Russians are going to invade. And Schultz said, well, maybe. And Biden said, well, if they do, we expect you to be with us. And Schultz said, I will. Um, and so, uh, although they didn't necessarily agree that the, that the, um, uh, that the war would happen, they did agree that if it did, um, they very much had to be on the same page and German policy had to change rather dramatically. Asking whether that came from US pressure or from German, uh, from a change of the German mind is a, this sort of a Zen question. It's like asking which blade of the scissors cut the paper. Um, but I think both were quite important. Thank you. Rike, you can uh, maybe, um, do you want to come in now on that because you're shaking your head? I have I have lots of things to say and okay. well, a number of things, but I keep it short. No, just I mean on 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 the side and I would put it this way. I mean there has been U U.S. pressure for a very long time, and very little has changed. And then you know the you had the Russian invasion and things changed. I mean I would say Zeitman specifically came out of a kind of shock to the German system more than kind of pressure from from anyone else. That doesn't mean that you know there hasn't been pressure from the U.S. or that it didn't make a make an impact, but but still. Um, I just wanted to kind of very briefly make make two points. I mean, number one, um, on the kind of you know where is the EU really moving forward, and 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 are we really doing more on security and defense? I mean, in a way, honestly, this is a kind of glass half full, glass half empty um, type situation. And on good days, I think the glass is half full, and on bad days, and higher today, I think the the glass is half empty. But more importantly, I mean, the reason why I I mentioned that um, you had all these kind of third third countries that are coming to people like us and saying, oh, what's going on? Like, do we need to be involved? It, this isn't so much about, you know, how you phrased it, Jana, that, you know, the EU is becoming more attractive and that people are necessarily want to be involved. It's more out of fear that they may be missing the boat and specifically on kind of industry questions, right? Because the EU is spending money and it is trying to build up its, its industrial capabilities. Whether or not that's going to work, we'll see. But third countries are kind of looking at this, thinking, are we going to have a disadvantage if we're not in? And so, so you kind of see that, you know, just from that point of view, things are definitely um, uh, uh, happening. Can and I? Can I? One... Can you? Can you? Can you yeah. um, go a bit deeper into this? Because there is also one question by James Bindernagel, who is uh, also mentioning the five hundred million fund, but also thinking of a. The creation of a multi-year financial framework mm -hmm. um and so do you think that there is a future where the eu will put even kind of more money like real money to the table where we might have joint debt um and where we kind of collectively invest a, a lot of money um organized and structured by the eu but compatible with nato in in european defense do you think that is likely and gustav has uh, a two finger on this but i need to go to Camille as well uh so maybe yeah. Maybe hold your breath, Gustav. Uh, Rike, you can uh, go on and then I go to Camille and then I come to you, Gustav. Sure. Um, I think that's definitely, so the, the idea of really putting real EU money in these areas is definitely something that's being pushed right now in, in Brussels and elsewhere. And I think it's important to note this was already happening before the invasion of Ukraine. And then the invasion of Ukraine happened. And not just that, but also the realization 
through this war that we um, that we saw that we don't produce enough, right? And we don't have enough capabilities. And so I think what we are seeing is is yeah, special funds, kind of you know funds from EU member states being spent on this, but also EU money. And this really is a big, big, big deal um, for anyone who knows the EU, actual common EU money being spent um, on this. So yes, I think I think things are moving here. The question is just, you know, is this enough? And will this have any in, can have any impact on the, the big actors uh, of the EU, European um, industrial market? And, and there, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't feel really qualified to, 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 to judge that. But as I was saying, it's kind of, it's enough to keep, to make people, to worry people uh, outside of the EU. And that's already uh, something. Okay, Camille, um, there is one question uh, also going into, I mean, you can comment on everything that you've just heard, but there is one question by Tim Lawrenson. Uh, he's rightly pointing to the fact that in the NATO EU declaration, um, there is this uh, beautiful phrase, we encourage the fullest possible involvement of the NATO allies that are not members of the EU in its initiatives, yet the EU is super kind of yeah protectionist uh, and is not really open to letting third countries in and you are both French and uh, you have been working for NATO so you kind of you have two identities that uh, might clash on this but um, so how do we square the circle who needs to move and you need to unmute yourself please Go. Sorry. Um, uh, the, uh, no, very quickly. Uh, so on the, on this last point, um, the EU of the fullest uh, possible uh, participation is standard uh, NATO language uh, to uh, to uh, cover the concerns of uh, non-EU allies. Uh, so, and then each ally has a specific concern, whether it's being uh, enabled its industry to join the project uh, or. Uh, uh, making sure that the EU doesn't take a decision on its own or whatever. The the bottom line uh, there, I think it, it's a bit. Uh, I think it's. Uh, I, I would take a, a, a case by case issue. Um, when you say fullest possible involvement, you know when the EU budget funds EU industry, I see it as very much the the various forms of Buy America Act, uh, Buy American Act of. Uh, uh, the Pentagon sponsoring uh, the the, the uh, U U.S. Uh, defense industries. It's a bit difficult to explain that the uh, European budget should sponsor um, uh, major um, American or British primes uh, uh, out of the EU taxpayers' money. On the other hand, where it becomes more absurd uh, is, for instance, when you take something like uh, the military mobility effort. Um, of course, it should be open to every NATO ally. Uh, it's um, uh, the UK and Canada and the US are part of it, not Turkey at this stage. It doesn't make any sense to think about military mobility across the continent and then pick and choose who you want on board uh, uh, and there. So I, I would try to distinguish where there is a sense of something that is helping the wider um, community or something which is a bit of industrial policy at home uh, where it sort of makes sense to argue that the, you you know try to explain to congress that the money allocated by congress to r and d in the u s should go to uh, French or German companies that would be a hard sell so so there there i think is is a is is an argument on the broader conversation I think what's interesting in is this really new and big. I think it, you know, again, I agree with the glass half full half empty metaphor. The reality is that for the first time ever, there are a few billions on the table out of the EU budget to sponsor defense industry. That is new, that is in the latest multi-annual financial framework, and that is direct funding of defense research, of defense military mobility, of defense issues. Um, and this is not insignificant. It's, uh, altogether, it's only about one or 1.5 percent of the what the Europeans spend uh, on on defense, but this is coming straight out of the defense budget, and this enables to do things that would have not been possible before, and that can be truly 
uh, useful. Um, uh, so, so from this perspective, I think we've turned a corner even before the Ukraine war. Uh, the, uh, and since Russia invaded Ukraine, there has been an even further change uh, with the use of the European peace facility, uh, with the fact that those 500 millions are allocated directly to uh, uh, support industry or with the notion of a sort of cashback mechanism for equipment donated to Ukraine. So altogether, we are we are in a moment where all of this is changing. And I think we need to acknowledge that uh, and, uh, and, 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 and respect that, even though, of course, this is by no means Um, uh, the sort of uh, the, the setup. Did we uh, lose each other? Uh, yeah, just you for, for, for two my seconds. Screen for, but maybe okay. you could take so another. Just... I didn't want to interrupt. I just have another question for you. No, no, and just one last one. I think we tend, and that's rather confusing, to mix up European initiatives with EU initiatives, with wider European initiatives. In fact, the reality of the current environment uh, is not so much European versus EU versus transatlantic and so on, is countries tend to pick and choose what's easiest and most efficient for them. So you have the Poles buying South Korean hardware because uh, that's uh, immediately available uh, and uh, uh, against uh, German or um, uh, uh, American solutions. Uh, uh, the, uh, you have uh, 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 tons of uh, uh, initiatives taken uh, by um, uh, 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 by by the sorry uh, uh, by, by the uh, um, uh, by uh, the Nordics, on, which are forms of minilateralism. Uh, so they they join forces and they do stuff together, uh, and we will see more of that, I believe. And then there are those who, uh, there are the, the things at 27 or the things at um, uh, 31 or 32 in the NATO environment. And all of these sort of supersede each other. Sometimes you end up with a very transatlantic uh, setup, other, uh, other times in a very limited European framework. So, so you, I think that the reality is not so much NATO versus EU than uh, all, all sorts of initiatives, sometimes involving two, three, five countries, uh, with a, a lot of uh, variable geometry, if I may put it this way. And I think this is important to take that into account. Uh, and if you look at the number of recent initiatives that were high profile, whether you look at the German European Sky Shield initiative, it's neither EU nor NATO, it's not all of each organization, uh, uh, it's trying to meet a demand. When the uh, French launched a few years ago the European Intervention Initiative, it was neither EU nor NATO, but it was supposed to support both organizations. So we, I'm, I'm, I, I suspect we'll see more and more of that. Yeah, to the horror of the Germans, but um, anyhow, that's not the topic here. Um, Tim Lawrenson, I think, made the point now again that it's maybe not only about money, but also about structures and instruments um, and that non-EU partners might be discouraged from participating because yeah, of the structures, they might not have enough of a say, but that's only a footnote. Um, I wanted to have, yeah. have you, you can comment on this, but I wanted to give you one question which we need to answer because our colleague Dominic Torkster from DGAP us, and I know that you look at this, has the Ukraine war led to a further consolidation of European defense industries at all? So are there any examples of, uh, yeah, a consolidated effort? Uh, I mean, the, the, the short answer is no, not yet, uh, but, but probably not yet. What I mean by that is that you will, you, we are seeing that a number of cooperation to deliver ammunition, for instance, um, uh, there are um, Anglo-Swedish cooperation, Franco-Swedish cooperation on 155 millimeter, uh, Anglo-Swedish cooperation on anti-tank uh, systems, um, uh, uh, German uh, uh, efforts on, in the domain of air defenses, uh, which come from the war in Ukraine. So I, I suspect that a sort of follow-up to Ukraine might be a further consolidation and an effort to uh, restructure a little bit the, the European defense market in order to be able to address all of that. For the moment, we haven't seen any deliberate consolidation on, 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 on that, that particular front. 
on on teams questions on the structures um it's a, it's a bit messy uh, uh first of all you have the uh, because you you end up with the um, eu comitology and how the eu works so you take the european defense agency the whole thing is who has an administrative arrangement with the european defense agency so there you have very different countries you have norway okay to be expected switzerland serbia ukraine uh, and more recently the united states but you don't have the uk or turkey so you you create a framework where you know the eda can work with a number of organizations but not with all of them on pesco it's a sort of a they pick and choose who they want to work with uh, uh, which is a bit a bit odd the commission itself has no habit of treating third parties um you know and making a special treatment for those who are the the close partners um uh, you know nato countries which is one of the issues that i think we need to resolve is to recognize uh, that you know both ways by the way that uh, in principle the default setting at least for non super sensitive information should be that we should be both open and sharing information as much as we can uh, and that's not the case because you know i'll tell you from my experience as a nato senior official you know there were papers which were literally which i could almost use with the press the content but i, I could not hand over to an eu colleague because someone had put a nato restricted stamp on it uh, you know one member state had said um, it should be this paper should be nato restricted so the content was absolutely non-sensitive, but I could not hand it over to an EU counterpart to say, oh, by the way, if you put money into something, why don't you spend on this? Those are our uh, defense planning priorities. So I could sort of, I could almost share that content with the press if I wanted to orally, but I could not hand it over formally to. And now it seems that connection wise, in France, yeah, the digitalization is not that advanced. Um, that gives me <laughs> that gives me an opportunity to move to Gustav. Uh, you wanted to say something about the ability of the EU, but then we also need to discuss Africa very shortly or very briefly, other areas yeah. non-Eastern uh, flank yeah. related. And we have nine minutes left. So Gustav, uh, keep it short. I then give Jeremy and Rico also the opportunity to come in again. Okay, so actually the beauty of NATO is that it's focused um, on a purpose that everybody really shares and not about Africa and not about the Middle East. Um, NATO's common and official involvement in all these issues was marginal. There were coalitions of the willing of many NATO and EU countries that, that had operations ongoing there, but NATO as a whole doesn't. Uh, uh, and you see actually in the war in Ukraine, I mean, Ukraine is neither a NATO nor EU member country. But uh, the, the kind of sort of right to exist is such a central value to Europeans that they throw much more money and equipment into this war than into out of area operations uh, somewhere in, in the rest of the world. Because if you throw money and equipment at out of area operations, you would have to have a common vision of what you want to achieve there. And that's usually quite impossible to come by with many countries. And that's 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 the crux on sort of what I said before, that if you don't have the mission, you'll never, you, you know, the bureaucracy doesn't matter. Now, but if you don't have the mission, that is a good, uh, I think, a good bridge for uh, one no, question. No, 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 let me say one okay. thing, because it hasn't been discussed and it's actually a crucial thing. Um, the problem in Europe with the defense market, you have, of course, you have sort of national parochialism. Uh, but the other thing compared to the US is that you have a, is a much adverse environment for um, enterprises, for defense enterprises when it comes to loans, um, to access to R&D funds, etc. Uh, in this, the Americans are much more happy to spend money to spend uh, on, on military applications of modern technologies and to, whereas in Europe, that's kind of booba. We don't do that. We, we love startup enterprises, but they shouldn't do drones. The, the, the thing is, most of the innovative applications of modern technologies like in drones, artificial intelligence, in automated weapon systems, etc., they will not come from traditional arms enterprises. They will come from fresh startups. Um, and to kind of redefine our own rules for investments, for learning, also to, to, to give defense enterprises more and better access to 
uh, insurance and, and financing through EU institutions, that would actually help a lot and, and uh, reset a lot of the imbalance that is happening now. Otherwise, um, we will by default buy American in 20 years because there will be nothing to buy in Europe anyway. How apologetic. Um, Jeremy, um, there was a moment when Camille said, yeah, NATO EU, and it's much clearer. NATO does the defense of Europe, and maybe the EU does the rest. But I have sometimes the impression that nobody else has any appetite to deal with, I don't know, um, as it is mentioned in one of the questions, the Sahel, Horn of Africa, Gulf of Guinea, North Africa, Middle East. And there was one specific question on the US willingness to engage in this region it was actually will the us continue to press and expand nato security sphere in africa uh, what do you think yeah um i don't think so um I, I i guess i would maybe half agree with gustav that um the us doesn't think that nato is a very good vehicle for that in part because it has other things to do in europe but also in part because it's not it's not the most agile and flexible format that the US could come up with for that region. I do think that, you know, overall, the US approach to NATO is maybe more instrumental than we're getting than we're getting at here, though. I mean, I think that, you know, it's uh, I think NATO is quite sacred in in Europe, it seems. In the United States, NATO is 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 a vehicle for American power, which has proven to be incredibly useful in a variety of different circumstances. Um, and frankly, if we noticed over the last over the last uh, few decades has been repurposed many times for many different things, including in Africa, because it did fight an entire war in Libya. Um, so I think it's not that the United States wouldn't do that. Um, and it's not that NATO is too precious. Uh, it's rather that it doesn't really uh, it doesn't really seem to be the right vehicle at, at this moment. I think that there is a big uh, it's very difficult for me to to sort of put my finger on what the U.S. is actually going to do in terms of its promote, uh, in, in terms of projecting security and stability into Africa, the logic of the U.S. national security strategy, the logic of the Asia First strategy, the 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 politics of um, ending all of the forever wars, which was which was pretty instrumental to to both the Trump and Biden administration, would imply that. They're just not going to be pushing any greater military power into that region. But um, I think that there is a lot of fear about growing Chinese and Russian influence. It is very difficult in U.S. politics to simply let those things pass un unexamined. The, the fact that nobody in the United States can identify Sudan on a map doesn't mean that the United States shouldn't be involved in solving the problem there. Um, and so uh, I think. There, there is a possibility that the, uh, and I think we've seen it over the last few years, that the U.S. will be expanding its security footprint there. But it's important to note that it doesn't really work at all with the strategy that they themselves have laid down. So there is one last uh, question, and uh, I hope Rike can answer it. Um, it is about, yeah, um, other regions. Um, and the question is whether, and it's specifically on the European Peace Facility, but maybe it applies to the EU more broadly, European Peace Facility was originally um, set up not only for Africa, but it came from the African Peace Facility model. Um, so do you think it is necessary that the EU will retain a more global focus again um, of power? Um, and um, yeah, will will it will the EU be able uh, actually to to um, how is it said here, uh, a glo more global focus of the EU power to be retained in the coming future, uh, also to uh, to take into account other areas in Africa, but here uh, it's also mentioned Asia and the Indo-Pacific. Do you think that is something that the EU can do? I mean, should it? Yes, to the extent that it is relevant for European security, and I think most of the time it is. Can it and will it? Difficult or I have my doubts simply because, you know, the challenges are getting ever greater. I think, you know, seems that nowhere things are getting easier. So, um, I mean, we, we, we should all be working towards, you know, making this, this happen, but I have 
right now, I would put it this way. Things are definitely moving and not just in the EU, but also in many EU member states, but almost nowhere nearly fast and, and strongly enough. And so, yeah, that's why, why people like ourselves, you know, keep doing these um, events and have conversations saying, you know, this is, this is really important and this isn't just, we're not just talking about something that's nice to have, but something that's going to be quite um, existentially um, important. So yes, Europe should have a, have a stronger um, uh, position on, on, on many of these issues. And we've been talking about the geopolitical EU for, for ages, and there is a reasonably good idea of what that would mean, um, and what that need to look like, let's put it this way. Um, but will we get there anytime soon? Um, right now, as I say, I, I unfortunately have my doubts. And I didn't want to end on something negative. Wait, I had some, can I, can I make one final sentence, something kind of positive, yeah. because there was one question. You have 30 seconds, because then we need to end. It is a 30 seconds, because there was a question on kind of domestic support, and do Europeans really want that? I mean, can I just say that whenever I go to any other, any European country and talk to like normal people, there are a lot of people that basically say, have, you know, Europe really should be doing more together, and why don't we, why don't we have a European army? I think that's a stupid idea. But anyway, I do think that European constituencies actually does do care quite a bit uh, about this. Positive note. Thank you very much. Uh, Camille, do you want uh, Ulrike to have the last word because you were thrown out of the call or do you want to um, just have really 20 seconds to add? I've been with, with the CFR for six months now, so I know that Ulrike gets the last word. Okay. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. So you've learned le uh, your lesson. Uh, and he learned so quickly. Yeah. <laughs> and Rico, with her pessimism, has made sure that we all stay employed uh, and can work on this topic because nothing will get fixed uh, soon and, uh, yeah, or in the foreseeable future. Um, so, dear um, listeners, dear audience, um, thank you very much for uh, your patience, for staying with us, for listening in. Um, thank you to my dear colleagues for doing this. Um, this is the end of our contribution to the Federal Academy uh, for Security Policies annual flagship conference. Um, and um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it and you will enjoy the other um, conversations that will take place in the coming days. Have a good evening. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thanks all. Bye-bye.